As we enter scene one, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego gather with the Chaldeans and the herald. When the music plays, you will all fall down and worship the golden image. Scene two, the king is standing in another part of the room and the Chaldeans go to the king. <laughs> oh king, those Jews you put in leadership are not worshiping the golden idol. What? Well, bring them to me. Scene three, the Chaldeans bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the king. <clears throat> Why have you not bowed down to worship the golden image when the music plays? In this, O king, we cannot obey. Our God will save us from the fiery furnace. And it will be known that he is God. <laughs> Guard, guard, turn up the furnace seven times hotter, bind these people, and throw them into the fiery furnace. <laughs> Scene four, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walk around the furnace unbound, walking with an angel. Wait just a moment. Didn't we just throw in three people bound up into the fire? Well, I can see clearly that there are four people in there with no bindings. Hmm. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out of there. Bless the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the most powerful one that brought you out of the fire, eh? <laughs> now, I decree, yes, I'll decree, let anyone who speaks ill of this mighty God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego let that person be cut up into little tiny pieces. Little pieces. Oh, and then we'll tear their house down too. Just for good the word of God presented in a visual way for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's about time you came around. Well, while we're getting the stage reset, I want to thank um, Gary Hutchison, who is a pastor from the Nazarene tradition, uh, for his willingness to uh, lead us in worship. Um, it is a great story. He presents it well. Most of you know him because he generally worships at this hour anyway. Uh, and if you have been attentive to, uh, and I'm not assuming that you might have, um, but he's been willing to preach for us after annual conference for several years so that those of us who are there can genuinely be there. Uh, we're glad to be back and very glad to have you leading in worship, Gary. We appreciate your willingness to do that on our behalf.
thank you, Pastor. It's a shame that that king is so shy. <laughs> he is the scariest thing I've seen since the Burger King King. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. I love this service. Amen. And I've gotten to the place after seven years where I've come to love so very many of you. On the liturgical calendar of the church, this is Trinity Sunday. So it does seem somewhat appropriate to be speaking about three individuals this morning. I have a couple of questions that I would ask you to consider with me as we begin our time together. First of all, have you ever heard someone say something like this? You know, once you become a Christian, you're going to have it made. Your problems are going to disappear and your life will be one of continual happiness and joy. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> or, how about this one? You know, if you're a Christian and you do what is right and honorable, then you're going to be treated fairly and justly. Well, obviously, I love the feedback. Neither of these statements is supported in Scripture. In fact, the Bible states repeatedly that Christians will suffer unjustly. Notice with me what the Apostle Peter says in his first epistle. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. Some Older Testament heroes who modeled this Newer Testament teaching are presented for us, and you've probably figured out where the story comes from by this point in the service, the third chapter of the prophecy of Daniel. Here we learn about three Jewish young men who faced a horrible death simply because they obeyed God. There are many lessons that we can learn from this ancient yet familiar story that can help us, even today, to learn how to handle tough circumstances and unfair treatment when they come our way. Now, as we have seen so vividly portrayed, <laughs> how do you follow that? Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, was a man of superlatives. The image he made had to be the tallest and the most expensive. The people he assembled had to be the most powerful and the most important in his kingdom. The penalty for disobedience had to be the most terrifying that he could possibly conceive. The furnace, for those who dared to disobey, had to be heated seven times hotter than normal. And the men who tied up the disobedient Hebrew captives were the strongest and most capable and well-trained soldiers in his army. The Bible tells us that having bound the three Hebrews, Nebuchadnezzar's soldiers carried them to the furnace and threw them in, likely through an opening in the very top. Though the three friends had bravely asserted their willingness to die this way rather than to bow to the king's idol, Still, can you imagine the actual experience of being tied up, bound tightly, and then carried toward the furnace must have been horrific. With the flames leaping from the top opening, 
the soldiers carrying the Hebrews still succeeded in reaching the mouth of the furnace and casting Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego inside. But they themselves were killed in doing so. The intensity of the heat was so great, their flesh was burned away. Their very breath was sucked from their lungs. Great and strong as they were, they died horribly, literally becoming human torches at the entrance of the furnace. On the other hand, for the three young Hebrew officials, the only thing that was destroyed in the furnace was the binding cords that had been used to hold them. God sovereignly chose to deliver his servants from the flames, to demonstrate authority over the earthly king Nebuchadnezzar and the fact that he was indeed the one true God. Now, most of us have heard this story or we've seen it played out from the time of our childhoods. There are many applications that can be made from this ancient account of courage and trust, but let me share with you just three. First of all, in verses 17 and 18, look with me, would you? The three young men are speaking, and they say to King Nebuchadnezzar, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. And then comes the most important part of this entire story. We miss it because of the drama that revolves all around it. But hear their next words. But even if God does not save us, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. The three Hebrews recognized that God's will for them might not be a lifestyle of comfort and ease. They realized that God's will might even lead them into very difficult and dangerous circumstances. But regardless of the consequences, they had made a conscious choice that they were going to obey the Lord and to do so without complaining or second guessing. The second application that I would share with you is this. The three young men in this story did not, let me repeat that, did not make their obedience to God contingent upon God doing what they thought the divine presence should do. They were not fair-weather followers or part-time servants. As verse 18 states, they were ready to obey whether God chose to deliver them from the furnace or not. In other words, these young men's allegiance and loyalty was to God alone, not in what God did for them. Several years ago, a worship song entitled Because of Who You Are was written and published. And thank you all. Worship team, I have heard that recorded by the Imperials, which dates me a bit. Uh, I sang it with a university quartet back in the Stone Age. But you all did that as beautifully as I have ever heard it sung. Thank you. Did you hear the words that our praise band shared with us for the offertory? So simple, yet so very powerful. Lord, I praise you because of who you are, not for all the mighty deeds you have done. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. You're all the reason that I need to voice my praise because of who you are. And the third and final application that I would share with you is this. If on this Sunday morning you can use a bright and shining note of hope, then look with me at verses 24 and 25. 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Now, from the ancient language in which this passage was first written down, there are two very real and distinct possibilities for the actual identity of the fourth person in the midst of the fiery furnace. The person is either an angel sent by God or Jesus in a pre-incarnate appearance. And from the language of the text, it seems likely that the fourth person was indeed actually our Lord and Savior. You see, Christ in similar form had appeared as the angel of Yahweh to Abraham at Mamre, recorded in Genesis chapter 18, and later to Joshua as the commander of the army of the Lord, recorded in the fifth chapter of Joshua, and throughout the Older Testament at various times to other individuals as well. This wonderful, familiar story provides one of the most powerful illustrations in all of Scripture of God's provision and tender watch care for his children. Think with me for just a moment. I think we ought to think once in a while when we come to church. Wow. Take note of that, Pastor. <laughs> have you ever considered that God could have delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego without sending a personal messenger into the flames? God is God, right? God is sovereign. God is omnipotent. God is omnipresent. He is omniscient. God could have, metaphorically speaking, snapped fingers and the flames would have immediately dissipated. But instead, God chose to deliver the servants by sending the divine presence into the very midst of the terrifying, horrific circumstances that threatened to overwhelm and destroy them. How great is that? God had permitted the men to be cast into the horrifying furnace. Yes. But in doing so, he literally went in to the trial with them. As missionary Wanda Knox used to say, the will of God will never lead you where the grace of God cannot keep you. Just this week, a wonderful live-action Disney film was released on DVD. Some of you have probably already purchased it, The Beauty and the Beast. I love the music in this movie. There is a wonderful song that is partially sung, How Does a Moment Last Forever? But the entire song is not sung during the course of the movie. It is, however sung by Celine Dion when she recorded a video of it. I want to read for you the lyrics of the second verse, and by changing just one word, you'll see how it applies to this story. Maybe some moments aren't so perfect. Maybe some of our memories are not so sweet. But we have to know the bad times or our lives are incomplete. Then when the shadows overtake us, just when we feel all hope is gone, we'll hear the song and know once more God's love lives on. A true story from the 19th century. A captain of a three-masted merchant sailing vessel was compelled to take his young daughter with him on a transatlantic voyage from Liverpool to New York. While away on his previous journey, his wife had died. 
and there was no family member left to care for his little girl for any extended period of time. And so he took her with him. In the midst of the crossing of the Atlantic Ocean, a terrible storm blew up with hurricane force winds and mountainous crashing waves. The ocean was whipped into a frenzy, and it seemed as though at any moment the ship might capsize or be broken in half. Because of the intensity of the storm and the manner in which the vessel was being tossed about, the captain ordered that he be lashed to the wheel so that he would not be swept overboard while trying to steer the ship through the storm. All the while this chaotic scene is unfolding on deck, the captain is thinking of his little girl. And so he orders his second mate to go below and check on his daughter who was sequestered in the captain's cabin. When the second mate knocked on the door, there was no answer. And so he carefully opened the door and peered inside. To his astonishment, the little girl was sound asleep in her bed. He walked over and awakened her and told her that he was going to take her topside in preparation for boarding one of the ship's lifeboats in case the order had to be given to abandon ship. The little girl looked up at the mate and asked him, Well, where's my father? Well, he's at the wheel steering the ship. Without a moment's hesitation, the little girl looked at the mate and said, Well, if my father's in control, then it's going to be all right. And she rolled over and went back to sleep. And sure enough, her daddy was able to steer the ship through the storm and take it safely into port. Now, you've already made the application. My dear church family, do you understand that faith is not belief without proof? It is trust without reservation. Like the captain's daughter and our Bible heroes in today's scripture lesson, we too can trust that in our moments of greatest need, in the hour of life's most desperate extremity, when we are most fearful, when life seems the most uncertain, our heavenly parent will come right into the midst of whatever the dilemma and the pain is to walk through it with us. And that's good news. That is the faith that makes us more than overcomers. The word of the Lord. Grateful for the ways that these ancient stories um, come alive in our